Hello everyone, bonjour tout le monde, le message en français va suivre. We want to review a few housekeeping items before we begin with the presentation. So yes, you are on the English link. Everything is good here. In the chat, I did post the French number to style in if you'd like to add the, the session to be in French. Please note the session is being recorded. It will be posted on our website for the coaching through COVID area. So if you're having, if you're connected at the moment, I'm going to ask that you turn your microphones off. So just for the sound for everybody else, please. So if everybody can have their, their microphones on off. Teams offers a built-in captioned, uh, closed caption function. So if you'd like to enable the closed captioning, simply click on the ellipses, three little dots in the menu at the top of your screen. And from the drop, drop down menu, select turn on live captioning. So this way you're able to read at the same time as we're speaking. If you prefer to listen in French for this session, uh, you can join the French audio stream by dialing the corresponding number that I've just posted in the chat. If you experience any technical issues, please message me just to at Francis in the chat and I will be there to support you. En français maintenant, alors Teams a une fonction de sous-titrage intégré. C'est en anglais seulement, mais si ça vous aide, c'est quelque chose que vous pouvez actionner vous-même en cliquant sur le, euh, simplement sur les petits points de suspension, euh, les trois petits points là en haut dans le menu à, à la droite de l'écran et dans le menu déroulant, sélectionnez « Activer les sous-titres ». Si vous préférez écouter la session en français, vous pouvez rejoindre le flux audio en français en composant le numéro euh, que j'ai mis dans le, dans, dans le chat en sous bois. S'il vous plaît, vous assurez que votre caméra est fermée, euh, que votre microphone est fermé aussi, s'il vous plaît, durant la duration. Euh, et puis, euh, de là, on peut vous aider. Si vous avez des, des difficultés, s'il vous plaît, euh, euh, dans le chat, euh, envoyez-moi un message à la commerciale à Francis et comme ça, je vais pouvoir vous aider. Alors, merci d'être venu nous joindre. Thank you very much for joining us. We will be starting shortly. Again, just a reminder to turn your videos off, to turn your microphones off, uh, because it is a panel of uh, athletes today. There'll be quite a few cameras on, and uh, we want to be able to record uh, the ones presenting and keep them in view as at all times. We are ready to start. Natalie, I will pass it on to you. Again, as a reminder, there is the French uh, telephone number you can uh, connect in, in the chat. Thank you and welcome everybody. Bienvenue tout le monde. So welcome everyone, bienvenue tout le monde. My name is Natalie Joannette and I am the professional coaching coordinator here at CAC. Je m'appelle Natalie Joannette et je suis la coordinatrice pour les services aux entraîneurs professionnels ici à la CE. Uh, thank you for being here today for our fifth out of six Coaching Through COVID webinars. So the purpose of the webinar is to support and re-engage coaches returning to sport. So we are attempting to pilot this in a bilingual format and hope that you can enjoy this webinar in the language of your choice. So there is a French conference call line for simultaneous translation, which the information will be posted in the chat shortly. Our format for today will be a panel presentation followed by Q&A. Um, so make sure to post your questions in the chat, language of your choice, and we will address them as we go. There will also be a link to a feedback survey to complete at the end of the webinar that will also be posted in the chat. I would also like to acknowledge the land on which we are gathered here today. Um, I'm personally in Ottawa on the unceded territory of the Algonquin people, so I welcome you from across our vast country. I also want to acknowledge that February is Black History Month, and we are excited to come together today to celebrate the success of Black coaches and athletes in Canada. 
Uh, today we have Coach Leanna Osei from the Black Canadian Coaches Association, which is the BCCA, monitoring our panel um, of athletes who will be sharing their stories in sport. We've been grateful to collaborate and work with the BCCA as they use their platform to advocate and support athletes um, and coaches that identify with the BIPOC community, which stands for Black, Indigenous, and People of Colour. And with that being said, I will pass the mic off to Coach Lee uh, to introduce herself and the panelists. Thank you, Natalie. That was a... Um an awesome intro. I'm excited to be here. Um, my name is Coach Lee. I'm the founder of the BCCA. I'm a former athlete and current youth sports coach at St. Francis Xavier University. Uh, the, I wanted to talk a little bit about the BCCA and I guess how we, how we got to this incredible point uh, where we have um, amazing coaches in this group chat here with us and uh, phenomenal uh, people who, uh, who also happen to be athletes uh, that are going to take us through this dialogue today. So in June 2020, uh, we incorporated the BCC as a not-for-profit organization. Uh, myself, along with a number of coaches, were really just struggling to understand, you know, how can we better support our athletes? I think that's what every coach kind of wakes up and, and thinks about. How can we better uh, better serve the people that, that we're servicing? In many cases, our athletes. And, um, and from that, the BCCA was born. Um, Actually, the inception of the organization started about two years ago uh, after uh, after an experience I had as a as a young coach at the youth sports level, um, and what turned uh, and what started from a passion project um, really was something that um, we were we were collectively compelled uh, to start um, this spring, really at the height of COVID and uh, many of the racial injustices that were perpetrated in the media. Uh, one of the organizations that we were lucky enough to uh, connect with really early on was the Coach Association of Canada. And so together uh, in October 2020, we launched uh, the inaugural Black Female Coach Mentorship Program. And, you know, why was this important? Why was this, why was this significant? I think it set a great precedent in our, um, in our Canadian sport community to carve out a space for people of color uh, through allyship. Uh, and so it's been an incredible opportunity um, providing mentors uh, with uh, with an opportunity to give their wisdom back to uh, mentees. Uh, we had an incredible, sorry, can you guys hear me? Oh, that might have been someone's mic. Yeah. <laughs> um, it Sorry, it allowed us to empower mentors as well as mentees across the country in various sports. Uh, and so uh, through this partnership that I started with CAC, we're really happy uh, to, uh, to come to you today uh, for coaching through COVID. And so uh, we have three objectives for the BCCA. The first is celebration. The second is advocacy through allyship. And the third is networking. And so uh, throughout this session, I think we want to do all of those three things. We want to we want to celebrate these athletes and their contributions to uh, to different sports. Uh, respectfully, um, we want to we want to advocate in as many ways as possible alongside everyone who is tuned into this chat. Um, and we want to network. Uh, and so before I give the floor to our panelists to introduce themselves. I was hoping in our chat, we could get to know you guys a little bit better. Could you put into the chat where you're tuning in from and what sport you coach, please? So I'll give you a couple seconds to do that. And what's going to happen the next few minutes is our ooh, table tennis, frisbee, athletics, gymnastics. We've got Quebec in the house, Toronto in the house, Hamilton, wow, Ottawa, hockey, Windsor, swimming. This is incredible. You know, I know we started at 5.30 officially, but um, I, was, <laughs> I, was, I was about to start having conversations with those of you that logged in early. Hey, Newfoundland. Okay, East Coasters. Oh, we've got wrestling in here. That is incredible. Manitoba. Welcome, 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 coaches. Ringette, uh, we got some multi-sport coaching here. Alpine skiing from Ottawa and Victoria, BC. <laughs> Very nice. Thank you guys so much for sharing. Um, wow, lawn bowling. I didn't even know that was a sport. Taekwondo. <laughs> okay, so just in the interest of time, as those start to come in, thank you very much for sharing where you're tuning in from and what uh, sport you coach. 
Uh, I am going to introduce our um, panelists one by one. Or I'm not going to introduce them. I'm going to give them the floor to introduce themselves. But what I would like you to do, coaches, is ask questions. If there's anything that is insightful or curious or um, or that you want to know uh, more about for our athletes, put them in the group chat as they present. Charity, why don't we start with you? Hi, everybody. Um, thank you so much for um, one, inviting me to be on this panel and, and everyone who's tuning in. Thank you for being here and showing up. Um, I am located on Lekwungen Territories, which is also known as Victoria, BC. Um, and in the chat, I saw a couple gymnastics coaches come in and I was like, oh, like a little bit of a throwback because that's kind of where my story started. Um, I play rugby currently right now for, for Team Canada, but I started as a rugby or a gymnast when I was like three years old. And I did that till I was around 13. And it was like my like true love. <laughs> um, I, I wanted to be an Olympic gymnast and I, you know, I put a lot of time and, and, and passion and energy into that sport but unfortunately um at the time and, and where I was in my life it was too expensive for me to continue on being a gymnast um and I had to quit and I was like kind of running around um without like without basically I felt like I was running out without my head like I didn't have a sport I was like oh my god how am I gonna get to the Olympics I was freaking out, and uh, when I went to high school, um, my older brother played football, and I was like, okay, like, this looks really cool. I kind of want to be just like him, but, like, they didn't have any um, female football teams. I actually played on the, the boys' football team in grade nine for a bit before, like, they all got really, like, large. <laughs> um, so I played on their team for a bit, and then one of my – um friends was like oh my gosh you should play rugby and I said I don't really know what that is like it seems kind of like weird um but she's like no you should do it I feel like you'd be really good so I went to practice um I like immediately fell in love with it it was like everything everything that like I was good at was in that sport and I, I was like I feel like I was always meant to be here um I played for about two ish years before I was carted to the national team. So I came to Victoria when I was 16 and um, I've basically been here ever since. <laughs> uh, I've, I'm, I've been here for eight years now and I've had a crazy journey on this team. Um, I started off obviously as a rookie. I was, let go from the team in 2015 just before um just before the olympic year which was like a really hard pill to swallow but um as i said before like the olympics was always my dream and so i was not gonna like give up on that or myself and i i um trained on my own and i was lucky enough to have an snc who um i guess saw something in me and like really he he trained me on his own time and his own dime really and um together like we got me back onto the team um about I think it was like six months before the games and and I went which was amazing I was the youngest on the team I was also the only um woman of color and for those of you I'm sure you all know but rugby was um like 2016 was the first time rugby sevens was in the Olympics so it was like a his historical moment for all rugby players but especially for me as I was the first black woman to go to the Olympics for rugby um for Team Canada and it was honestly like such an honor um but also something that I didn't like really realize the gravity of until now to be honest which I like sometimes frustrates me but in the moment like in the moment it felt like I was kind of on this journey by myself and and like, I've always kind of, um, I've always been kind of my own cheerleader. And so when I, when I got to the Olympics, it felt like, it felt like I 
I had I had gone there and and obviously I had people supporting me but it felt like I was like thinking like mostly of me and and like you know I was like oh my god finally like I got here I'm here like this is just such an amazing moment but I didn't really take it like a second to think about like the millions and millions of like young black women and like children and even like boys who are like looking at me in this position and seeing me represent Canada um the first and like how big that is and how important and how necessary it is to see that kind of representation um yeah so it wasn't really until now that I'm I'm more involved in social justice and I'm and I'm more involved in community and the different intersections and I'm like doing all this work where I'm like wow like take a second to, to realize that like there's there were like people looking at you in that moment and like you know when I was at the Olympics I was a rookie so I didn't actually do all that much I think I played honestly like five minutes um the entire tournament and so it wasn't really like my games but what I like what I did do was I showed up and I stood tall and I show people that like this is possible and and like being in this space is something that like is attainable for all of us and I like that is where I like I get a lot of like my um I guess like my gratitude from is knowing that there are like young women um aspiring to be in that space that I, I really really truly love um and yeah since I don't even know how to begin to talk about this year like I feel like everyone's probably had the same sentiments of like mm. we have to do something now and and I mean we've always really had to do something and there there's what we've always had to put our like our heads on and grind but I think something that's like very like frustrating and difficult but also very um like inspiring about this year is that like every single person like everybody in this like earth realistically um is like going through it and needs to be pulled through and I think because we're all going through it it's really like put a put a like some it's really shown some light on communities that have like perpetually been in this um kind of like form of oppression and so I think because because of the pandemic and because like people are like not able to go to work every day and people like and athletes aren't able to like train the way they used to and everyone's schedules are different and everyone's life looks a little bit different it's really like given an opportunity for um people who like haven't really always had a voice to be like this is what's happening this is what's this is like how it's been this is how I've been feeling like this is not really new I don't know if, um yeah about any of the other BIPOC people on this call right now but there's a lot of things that I've experienced this year or that I've seen um other people experience this year that like I have felt my entire life <laughs> and um Charity? it's always like sorry thank I, I wanted to I wanted to pause you there because we definitely want to continue that conversation in this chat. I wanted to give the um, our other panelists an opportunity to introduce themselves before we get into those questions oh, about sure. how, yeah. how challenging this year has been. I really yeah. I really love how you talked about um, your introduction to to rugby and how it was kind of in a roundabout way. It wasn't even a sport that initially you wanted to start, yeah. and then it was like, oh, this is. Like I'm really good at this, and not only were you really good at it, you were like Olympic level, and that's incredible. Uh, and we definitely want to get back to that, uh, back to that, and get more of your thoughts, as well as um, some insight as to how you've been contributing to the space. Uh, Mr. Chris Johnson, can I get you to introduce yourself? Yeah. Um, how you doing? Um, Christopher Johnson uh, from North Preston, Nova Scotia. Um, I started playing basketball. My sport is basketball. Um, I started playing it at a very early age. Um, of course, Coach Lee knows now basketball is not the biggest thing in Nova Scotia, or it wasn't at the time. Um, so I ended up going, to, after high school here, I ended up going to Ontario and playing um, two years at Eastern Commerce Collegiate High School, where I met Coach Lee, um, Powerhouse High School there. Um, from there, my journey went on to 
Dallas, Texas. Um, I played in the Region 14 at Kilgore, um, Kilgore College. And then from there, I went to the NCAA. Um, I played at St. Bonaventure, um, went to the NCAA tournament, um, won the A-10 championship. Chris? From there, yes. Sorry to interject. Chris, could you move your camera up just a tad bit? We're missing a, a, a little bit of your face there. Okay. Can you, is it good now? Um, maybe turn your camera off and back on. This is this is perfect, like COVID, <laughs> like what happens in COVID, all these tech issues. Okay, that's a lot better, Chris. Sorry about that. No problem. Um, could you hear me fine? Yes. Yeah. And you're okay. and you're feeling perfect. Yeah. Yeah. Just to pick it up from there, but um, yeah. Um, spent two years in um Saint Bond Adventure. Um, from there went on to play professionally. Had a stint in China. Um, played in played in England for played played in England. Um, played in Portugal, Germany. Um, afterwards, actually, my um, my career came back to Canada. I played in the NBL the past three years. I played with uh, PEI, K. Breton, and last season played with the Halifax Hurricanes. Um, came home, played with the Halifax Hurricanes. Um, with doing that, also started up a nonprofit organization called the Tunnel Vision Association. Um, through that, just wanted to kind of mentor youth, um, bring basketball to the city, and try to bring some exposure with it teaching fundamentals and giving people a platform to kind of showcase their skills. Um, this this past season, actually last year, is when our season kind of got cut short due to COVID um, in the NBL. And, you know, it was a difficult time for everyone, um, including myself and my little brother who was in Ontario playing at the same time. And, you know, just seeing, for me, being an athlete, having the game taken away from me, uh, us being older, we can kind of find different avenues and different ways to put our energy into things. But being a kid at that time and, um, you know, having basketball or a sport that you're passionate about taken away without any doors opened up, I feel like that would have been a tough thing. So um, through my organization, we created um, the anti-racism movement. Um, not not created, but we kind of piggybacked off it. And we created the art tournament, which is, um, you know, the anti-racism tournament. We did a three-on-three tournament here, um, spread it out between five different courts, courts, um, cities around here. Um, we hosted 55 different teams and just try to bring everyone together for a positive thing. So we're trying to bring basketball as a platform and try to use that platform as a chance to, you know, kind of bring people together for, you know, the movement and the, and the importance and the importance of what was going on. Um, that actually spent into um, a league that we just finished off doing. And, um, you know, leagues and stuff out here were canceled. So we kind of just took that movement and kind of turned it into a league. And, you know, we just kind of been busy through that. So, you know, just been trying to coach through COVID and, you know, open up a platform and a door for the kids to still give them exposure and a chance to be seen, even though, you know, initially their sport would be done. Thank you, Chris, for taking us through kind of your your beginnings. And uh, as he mentioned, I actually met Chris when I was a senior in high school, junior and senior high school, and uh, Eastern Commerce, which is a downtown Toronto, it's closed now powerhouse uh, basketball school, uh, piloted um, what we see a lot of now, which are prep schools. So uh, Roy Rana, who is uh, who's, uh, one of our most esteemed and decorated coaches, who's uh, in the NBA now and uh, formerly um, with our Canadian team, um, he was the athletic director and uh, Greg Francis, a, a coach. And anyways, it's been incredible uh, learning your story, Chris. And just to contextualize the art tournament a little bit more, uh, in Nova Scotia, uh, I'm I'm fairly certain we've got the fewest cases of COVID across the country, and so what it allowed us to do was actually return to play, uh, or the or the closest I think you could get to that in the summer, uh, Chris's Chris's art tournament, so ART uh, anti racism tournament was the first event that was held uh, in the province of Nova Scotia. I think coming out of the COVID area, and I I kind of had my feelers out what's going on in different provinces, but uh, incredible turnout. Thank you so much, Chris, for sharing. Um, before we get to our next uh, athlete who's going to introduce, what, who is going to tell us a little bit about themselves, I wanted to remind our attendees, if you get any, if you have any questions about uh, about the stories, please feel free to drop them in the, into the chat. And now I would love to welcome to the stage, our virtual stage, of course, Ms. Shanice Marcel. Thanks, Lee. Um, yeah, so my name is Shanice. Um, I grew up in Victoria, but I'm currently living in Toronto, Ontario. I play for the Canadian Beach National Volleyball Team. 
Um, and kind of much like charity, I lucked into finding volleyball. Um, I think I was in the fifth grade when one of my school teachers kind of randomly came up to me and asked me to try out for the team because I was tall. Um, and luckily I fell in love with it right away. And I would kind of characterize my journey in sport as kind of two different parts. One was very much a fairy tale. Um, I, two years after getting involved in the sport, was named to the youth national team. From there, I got to play as part of the junior national team. Um, I went to my dream university at, at UBC, and where I, we had a, an amazing five years and won five national championships in a row. And then from there, I went to play overseas in Europe for three years. So I played in Germany for two years and France for a year, um, all kind of training to go to the 2016 Olympics. Unfortunately, we didn't qualify as a team, and that's kind of when things went downhill for me, and I suffered um, two back-to-back -back injuries that were potentially career-ending. So I had shoulder surgery, then I had knee surgery, and then I kind of made the decision to hang up my court shoes and, and trade things in for the sand. Um, and kind of when I was going through that experience, I, I needed a way to still be involved in volleyball, and I needed a way to give back to the community. So I, I um, decided to take up coaching part-time. So I got involved in the provincial programs. Um, and then for the last three years, I've been an assistant coach with York University um, and just really, really proud of being, you know, one of four, I think, black female coaches or black coaches in general in, in the sport of volleyball um, and just kind of being that person that, you know, those young kids can look up to. So that's kind of where I'm at now, juggling both my athletic career and my coaching career and, and trying to make the best out of both of them. Thank you, Shanice, for sharing with us uh, that incredible journey. Uh, repping the West Coast, and, uh, and now you're coaching at York University, and I grew up watching a lot of York games. I didn't catch any volleyball games, unfortunately, but I think it's incredible how almost halfway, I guess, through your career, you switched from indoor volleyball to, to beach volleyball. Uh, so I think that's, that's just an incredible transition there. And, of course, you're coaching now, so coaching through COVID. All right, we are going to jump to our last um, panelist here, last but, but certainly not least, Mr. Skylar Thomas. What's going on, everybody? Uh, happy Black History Month. Super excited and honored to be a part of a panel of uh, such powerful people. Um, but my name is Skylar Thomas. I'm from Toronto, Ontario. Uh, I've been playing soccer ever since I was five years old. Uh, as soon as I stepped on that field, I just immediately fell in love. And uh, I've been in love ever since. Um, through some amazing coaches throughout my youth career, uh, I have had the pleasure of getting a scholarship to Syracuse University, where I studied economics for three and a half years. And then I got drafted to my hometown team, Toronto FC, which was a, a dream come true. Um, and I've been playing professionally ever since. That was in 2015 throughout the USL, uh, which is Second Division America, and the CPL, which is uh, the Canadian Premier League. Um, it's, been a, it's been a beautiful experience um, to this day. Uh, really thankful, I guess, for all the coaches that have instilled so many great values in me. Um, I guess it was in my fourth professional season where I felt it was time for me to start sharing my experiences and my knowledge to the next generation of young footballers. Um, while I was down in Charleston, South Carolina, uh, I just created my own soccer training business uh, where kids would come to me, get their individual training. Of course, they would go to their team and get their team training. In between, they really had a difficult time continuing to train at home. I had a super ambitious group of, of young players that really wanted to take their game to the next level. Uh, and I just figured out that they wanted that, that uh, tool to help them train at home. So in 2018, I just tried to serve that market uh, and created Kick Deck. Kick Deck is your personal soccer trainer in a deck of cards. Uh, and we provide simple, fun, effective, and educational at-home training for, for youth athletes around the world. Um, and it's just been an awesome experience to provide that tool for them in such a difficult time. And um, it's also been an awesome experience to transfer over to that coaching part of soccer while juggling the professional career as well. Um, so that's that's a little bit about me. Uh, I guess like we've all like we've all experienced, it's been a, it's been a difficult year, but it's brought inspiration and motivation to have conversations like this 
with a, with a bunch of great people at the table. So uh, thank you guys so much for listening, and I'm excited to uh, answer any questions. Thank you, Skylar, for the intro. So just to overview, we've got four um, we've got four athletes here. We've got um, four different sports represented. We've got rugby. We've got volleyball. We've got basketball. We've got soccer. Uh, we've got U sports athletes, uh, former athletes. We've got NCAA Division One former athletes, uh, and so really incredible, really incredible group here. Um, I actually wanted to to jump right into some of our questions here, and our first question is, how can coaches support Black athletes? But before I get our panelists uh, to to uh, give us what what they feel are some of the important things to consider. I was curious for our coaches here. I know we've got a wide variety of sports. I'm curious to know how many uh, coaches here um, work with uh, BIPOC athletes. So any racialized minorities on your team. And uh, oh, I'm seeing some hands come up. Maybe, okay, perfect. Okay, actually I can see hands. Okay, so more than five, more than seven. Okay. What's been really interesting through my work uh, with the BCCA is uh, I've had my head buried in particularly basketball almost all my life. And uh, what's been incredible is just um, conversing and meeting new coaches and uh, especially coaches from sports that uh, historically don't have much diversity. So Charity had shared with us that she was one of, um, she was the first black female to represent um, Team Canada uh, uh, as part of the Rugby Sevens. Shanice as well is one of the few uh, women of color um, who are coaching volleyball. And so that's kind of an interesting dynamic that I wanted to put to the group. Um, thank you for sharing. Uh, and I will put that question to uh, our panelists. How can coaches support their black athletes during this time? Charity, why don't you start us off? For sure. Um, I think for me, one of the biggest ways that coaches can show, show their support is just to understand that, like, the amount of, like, um, I'd say, like, invisible labor that that I feel like a lot of BIPOC people um, go through every single day is actually quite exhausting. And often, like, I'm like as a like especially being in a team like I might not be able to show up the same way that some of my like non-BIPOC teammates can show up um when things happen in community around the world and mm -hmm. so I think for me the biggest way to show support is just to know that like sometimes I'm gonna need like a mental health break or I'm gonna need um the environment to be to be one that is is open with or understanding with the fact that like um, you know, if, if there was a, for, if there was a murder and, you know, in, in which case it was someone like George Floyd, mm. um, being killed, I'm, I'm most likely not going to be able to show up on Monday morning and do some testing or like throw a ball around because, you know, my heart and my mind are elsewhere. And so I think like, that's something that I, um, I would, would appreciate coaches adopting is the fact that like we're like holistic human beings and there's things happening all over the world and and um sometimes sport isn't the most important thing as much as this, this is my job and this is my career like sport isn't always the be all and end all like what's really important is is us as um, human beings and and um understanding our experiences are different than others Thank you, Charity. Um, and just to reiterate that really important part um, about the awareness that coaches should have as things happen in our in our landscape. And, and certainly when everyone was trapped at home at the height of COVID and unfortunately kind of the intersection of um, the Ahmaud Arbery uh, tragedy, the George Floyd tragedy, it made it so difficult for co for uh, for coaches, but also for athletes, uh, especially for athletes. And and when I think of athletes, I'm I'm almost always just because I am a youth sport coach, I'm thinking about the young people uh, that I that I service and being able to uh, be in the know. Uh, I think is one thing. Um, 
you know, it kind of makes you wonder about um, black athletes that may be the only one on their team and, and how they might um, um, struggle uh, with, with their mental health in terms of that. The awareness, I think, is, is a huge key. Thank you, Charity. Uh, Shanice? Yeah, I think, first of all, Charity, that was really beautifully said. Um, I think for one thing, it's really important that BIPOC athletes feel seen and valued and heard. Um, I think so many times in sport as coaches, we can get really caught up in like the aspect of winning or losing. And then your relationship with your athletes almost becomes transactional. Um, you know, you're trying to, to find move pieces of the puzzle to make sure that you're doing better and, and beating the next team. Um, but I think so much of coaching is really fostering and developing important relationships with your athletes that go beyond the field of play and that go towards, you know, understanding who they are and listening to their experiences and really taking that for what it is. And, you know, you might not always understand what another person is going through, but I think as coaches, we need to, um, in some instances, learn how to show a little bit more empathy instead of, you know, expecting our athletes to always be 100%, to always perform at their best level. You know, as an athlete, that's what you're always going to try to do, but it's not easy to do every day. Thank you, Shanice. That was, uh, that was really spot on. Um, and particularly in, in how you, you differentiated between what we refer to as transactional coaching and transformational coaching. And uh, we have a question in here that I think is is um, it's it stems from Charity sharing her experience with us. But I think um, all of our panelists can speak to this. So if you are a coach and we know there are things going on outside of sport, what is the best way forward in the moment? Is it that um, I need to go in and pull Charity off to the side? Is that is that what we should be trying to do with our black athletes or um, is it that we should be addressing it to the team and not trying to make it so personalized and and addressing the team as a whole? And um, maybe maybe um, charity, I know the question was addressed to you, um, but 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 so I I want to play devil's advocate a little bit because I think there's a there's a couple of different um, things that you that you have to consider. Uh, and so Skyler, maybe let's hear your thoughts uh, and then and then we'll circle uh, back to Christopher and charity as the question was intended for her. Got it, yeah. Um, playing down in the States last year in Pittsburgh, uh, while everything was going on, uh, I guess it, it became very clear to me that conversations with the whole group really helped. Um, that's just my opinion. I preferred to have the conversation you know, with the, with the coaches, the teammates, uh, black, white, and everything in between. Um, even the front office staff, I feel like having those uncomfortable conversations and going into an intimate uh, conversation about how everyone's feeling, um, where they're at mentally, and and involving the whole group in order to find solutions and, and make sure that everyone's feeling comfortable in that environment. Um, I feel like in other instances, coaches would rely on the black players to kind of solve the issue and talk about the issue. Um, for me, that was a little bit uncomfortable. I just felt like it was a conversation that the whole team and the whole organization should have been having uh, to include everyone and, and to hear everyone's voice and, and have everyone uh, feel heard. Thank you, Skylar. So, so Skylar is really pro coaches taking that leadership and making sure that it's a priority to have that conversation with the group. Chris, what are your thoughts here? Uh, I definitely, um, I agree with what he said. Um, I think so too. I think group discussions tend to most times make things more comfortable, especially when you can hear other people's opinions and stuff and make it feel like it's a more family issue more than an individual. But mm. I think there are times too where um, you can benefit from pulling the kid aside and having that one-on-one. -on -one and, you know, because I know for me as an athlete too, um, it's kind of, it would be hard for me to open up in front of a group. Like you would be able to get more from me as a player um, mm -hmm. with a one-on-one -on -one audience rather than a team based around, um, mm -hmm. based on me just, you know, like I just feel more personal if it's one-on-one, -on -one. but I know with other groups um, and other people, like I think both ways could work out. Like I think like, you know, having that 
one-on-one -on -one the woodwork and I think having that opportunity to speak amongst each other would help out too. Know that you have a family with you. Thank you, Chris. And uh, Charity, I wanted to circle back to you and 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 get your thoughts as well. Yeah, um, I would I would kind of want to piggyback off of what Chini said earlier. I think one of the most like one of the most important ways that we can um, like have these conversations is to be relational and like have already had these conversations mm. and like we'd have like you know one of the biggest struggles that I had with my team this past year is we've never spoken about this before. It's always been like, like us, like not really us versus them, but like, I'm not, I'm not comfortable. So therefore like, we're not having this conversation. And now when things, now when there's like all this pressure and there's like, you know, death after death and like all these marches and all of these um, community involvements and there's so much happening. Um, like we're having these very, like very difficult um hard scary but like strong conversations for the very first time in the middle of all this heat and like i think that's one of the biggest downfalls is like to not already have done it to not already have to not already know um you know how your athletes might react to not already know um what might be the right route to take like that i think is the problem is that like we were i feel like sport is like a very colonial um like institution or entity and like um mm. i think when we think about like decolonizing it's like okay how do we like get to the root of it like how do i have a conversation with you when like before you're in pain like how do i you know how do i know you before you're struggling and then and now when you are in those positions like i know how to move forward that makes Thanks. sense no that does make sense that makes a lot of sense um, how can we be proactive instead of reactive, right? And really taking those steps. And that's a great segue to our next question. So we've got we've got so many coaches on here that are ready to learn. Uh, we've got athletes here willing to share. Um, but to what extent are we looking at our sport organizations and our sport administrators to lead? So, for example, I coach at the U Sport level, and um, again in 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 June 2020 and steadily throughout. We didn't have um, any person of color in our youth sports infrastructure, um, in our conference leads, um, and in many cases, our, as our athletic directors. And so it was difficult because, um, you know, where does, we, we know for coaching, we know we're trying to service our athletes, but um, do we think that coaches should also be looking at our, our, our sport programs and our sport administrators to lead um, in that way? Where do we think that responsibility falls and what does it look like as opposed to a coach having a one-on-one -on -one conversation with an athlete? Why don't we start with um, Skyler? Yeah, this is a great question. And I think it's the question that we need to be asking. Um, instead of getting to the point where uh, the conversation is extremely difficult and there's a lot of emotions involved. Let's see if we can uh, figure out a way to solve or help the issue a little bit earlier. And I think representation is huge. Um, I know growing up, there were a lot of black soccer players that I looked up to. Uh, soccer happens to be a very multicultural sport. And it just made me, it made it a lot easier for me to step on that field, feel welcomed and be able to uh, become the, the very best soccer player I can be. Um, transferring into that coaching community, uh, I'm finding it difficult to find those black role models uh, at the head coach position, assistant coach position, front office position. Uh, so I feel like finding uh, the correct individuals to put in those positions to just create that representation to make um, it a lot more achievable for, for people in my position to, um, to excel in sport, really. Thank you, Skylar. Shanice? Yeah, I think this is a, um, a really important question. Um, you know, people often say you cannot be what you can't see. And for me in the sport of volleyball growing up, I know I was one of very few. And 
even now as a female coach, as a woman of color in coaching, there are very few of us. And it's really hard to um, try and break through those barriers um, because leadership comes from the top down. I think if you look at most of the largest um, NSOs, so the national sport organizations and probably the PSOs as well, provincial sport organizations, I would say maybe less than 10 percent are people of color in those leadership positions. So, you know, this summer when the Black Lives Matter movement happened and, you know, these organizations are putting out their black squares and and saying that they condemn racism in all its forms, that's great. But what are the next steps being done? What action is actually being put into place so that, you know, black athletes, black coaches, people of color are respected in those spaces and feel safe and welcome? So I think, you know, a lot of administrations really need to take a look at who are in those leader pos leadership positions and how can we, you know, make those more diverse um, or higher qualified people to be in those positions that can speak to diversity, that can, you know, understand those experiences because they've been there themselves. Absolutely well said. Uh, you cannot be what you cannot see. Um, Charity, Chris, did you want to build on on any of these points? Um, <clears throat> yeah, I I was just thinking of a uh, something that happened to, with with my team just recently, and um, like my rugby is a predominantly white sport. I'm not like I'm sure you all know, um, but uh, like all of our executives and and our front office people and everyone, they're for the majority are are like um white males and so there's like there's very little representation especially for for women but for women of color as well and we had this situation where um something had happened in community and um the people the the athletes of color asked that um it be recognized publicly on the on rugby canada's instagram page and there was a little bit of, of like pushback because there was you know there's a little there's not much education around it and and they didn't really know what to say and so yeah. they brought it back to the board and they discussed it and they came to the decision that they weren't going to post about it yeah. and i mean that's fair like that was their decision but um when they asked how i felt about it i said you know it's it's really difficult for me to understand like how you came to the decision when you're missing like every other voice in the room like there are only white voices in the room and like to me it's like you you're never going to be able to have a holistic answer when you only have one voice and so when we think about like diversifying it's it's one for representation it's so that like athletes and and people and whoever can see that they can be in those spaces and then it's also that you're able to like understand um you know which athletes need what and you're able to educate yourselves every single day instead of like kind of going back and hearing the same thing that you're comfortable with over and over and over again. So I think, yeah, diversity in those positions is really important and absolutely necessary um, if we're going to be moving forward with the, if we're going to be moving forward at all. <laughs> yeah. Right. To get that to get that positive change, and um, it, it it makes me think about our uh, our beginnings as an organization. Uh, we we had some specific calls to action centered around representation. One of them was thinking a little bit more critically about our hiring uh, practices and, and policies and ensuring that there are uh, diverse people at the decision-making table. Because now when you when you think about, you know, who does this impact? Who are we servicing? You, you want to make sure that you do have uh, people from different walks of life uh, that can uh, that can provide that that alternate dynamic, right? And and so I think a lot of it is is without malice, but it comes down to that uh, to really opening the doors for people of color. We need to, Rahul says, we need to affect systemic change as opposed to cosmetic change. That's absolutely right. And we need to work to have all the voices in the room uh, at the top. That's a great, that's a great, um, that's a great point to make as well. So we're in February right now, coaching through COVID, BIPOC athlete panel is in February. Um, two questions for my uh, panelists here. Um, what does Black Heritage Month uh, or uh, for certain people African Heritage Month mean to you? And has this has this month felt different than other months before? And uh, Chris, why don't we start with you? Chris is Chris is 
born in North Preston, which, uh, which is the largest um, community of black people, um, I believe in, in the country, the largest, uh, I guess, percentage wise. So why don't we start with you, Chris? Uh, <clears throat> I think, I mean, this is probably the first, I mean, having Black History Month through the pandemic is different. Um, but I, I think for me down here in Nova Scotia, it's been like, a, I find like the schools have been putting the emphasis on trying to get more representation in. Um, I know a lot of, a lot of like people around here um, that have been like doing things through school, color people, um, myself too, my organization, having my little brother and cousins and stuff like that. Um, I think, I feel like the effort's been there in terms of around here, in terms of schools and trying to get people in um, that a lot of people can kind of relate to. Um, working with the African cohort down here in Horton and stuff like that, like different schools. So I feel here we've been putting an, an emphasis on it. Um, I mean, definitely always, I feel like it's always could be more. I'd say it could be emphasized more than one month throughout the year as, as well. Um, but I think I think we're trying to make a change um, and trying to make a step in the right direction. Thank you, Chris, for sharing uh, sharing with us what your thoughts about African Heritage Month have meant, and especially in a year in a year like this. And I would agree. I think there's definitely been a turning of the tide here. Um, Charity, why don't we get your input here? Yeah, I I agree. Like it's it's definitely it feels like a much larger larger scale than it's been in a while. Um, some sometimes I'm I'm like I'm frustrated by by how much bigger it is because like it, it should just be like this all the time and like it actually should be like this um like every month every day of the year like to celebrate and and highlight and um make space for for BIPOC voices and um I think is like it's always very important um but as, I think as frustrated as I am I'm also like grateful because like I mean I would probably assume that a lot of the things that people are putting out is very performative but regardless of where it's stemming from, it's still being put out and being seen by people who need to see it. And so for me, I'm like, you know, the more the merrier, like, you know, your intentions probably aren't the same as my intentions, but because you feel pressured into doing this, like someone who may not have seen themselves represented in a long while is having the opportunity to see them. And I think that's important, so. Thank you, Charity. And uh, just to build on that, I think we need to celebrate um, black black heritage every month of the year. I think we've got to build sustainability in that, and and that's how we get away from, you know, just looking at at February as as uh, as the as the month. Um, uh, Skylar and Shanice. Yeah, um, I think Black History Month is an awesome opportunity to reflect on the heroes from the past that were able to get us to where we are today. Um, I think it's a great opportunity to, like you said, celebrate our culture and uh, amplify our, our voices today and figure out a way to push the movement forward, right? Um, there were so many people that sacrificed their lives uh, to get us where we are today. And I think we all as individuals and as a community need to figure out how we want to continue to amplify our voices, uh, support the black community, uplift us and make sure we, uh, we're creating equal opportunity for, um, for the black community. Can you hear me? <laughs> okay, um, for me, um, so I'm biracial. I um, I didn't grow up with my black father. I didn't grow up with that, you know, understanding of my history and my heritage. So this past year has kind of been a whirlwind trying to, you know, come to terms with a lot of things. And growing up, because I didn't have those experiences, um, and I was bullied and you know experienced lots of racism, and and that made me resent a lot of parts of this of what made me me. Um, so I think for me this year, Black History Month is, is to everyone's point, something to celebrate. It's something to be proud of the people that came before us and the people that will come after us who, 
you know, are blazing a trail, who are accomplishing incredible things, who are being incredible advocates for Black people and who are, you know, stepping into their voice, stepping into um, leadership roles to really um, uplift everyone's Black voices. So for me, it, it is a little bit different this year. It is a little bit um, more special. And, I, and I'm happy to see, you know, the effort that is being put forward by by so many people, whether it is performative or not. I think it's just really important that these conversations are being had um, and that hopefully they continue, you know, for years to come. Thank you, Shanice. That's, that's real. That's real. We have a question here. Um, question is, have the panelists felt extra pressure to perform athletically because they were Black? And I also wanted to take this moment as we start wrapping up um, to uh, to also tab on to that, and if there was if there was one thing that you wanted our coaches to take away uh, with them, what would that be? So have you felt that pressure um, in your space, in your respective sport? And then what would, for, for your sport specifically, but I guess for coaches generally, what would your advice be? And um, why don't we start in the reverse way that we went? Um, so Shanice, maybe you could start us off here. Yeah, of course. Um, I don't think I'll try and keep this really short, but I don't think I've felt any, you know, extra pressure to be to perform um, because I'm black. But at the same time, um, it is something that's like very inspiring for me. So I had an instance a few years ago when I got into coaching where I had this interaction with this young biracial woman and, you know, she didn't talk to me about anything volleyball related, but she just asked me this question of like, do you like your hair? And that really made me like step back and think of when I was, you know, her age and how I didn't and how I wasn't like embracing those parts of me. Um, so like to be able to be in the position where I am now, where I can tell her to be proud of who she is and, and you know, where she comes from, that was like so empowering to me. And, you know, to continue to be in this position where I am a high performing athlete and I am a high performance coach, to me, that's just like an incredible level of, of pride that I take. Thank you, Shanice. Skylar? Um, I don't think that I've ever had added pressure to perform athletic beauty because I was black. Um, not that I can remember. Uh, I don't think that would be the case. Um, but I guess just for all the coaches out there, uh, these conversations definitely do uh, get uncomfortable, but don't be afraid to have them, right? Your your, your players are, are human. Uh, they have feelings. They have emotions. Um, definitely continue to move forward with empathy. Have those conversations and make sure that you put them first before their performances, I would say. Thank you, Skylar. Charity? Yeah, um, I've, yeah I, I've definitely been in positions where, like, I've been ex expected to perform because of the color of my skin and um <laughs> it's never fun uh so yeah like and, and kind of something what what Skylar says it was like and but like like seeing the, the person first and not the athlete first I think like people just saw me as this like um uh, or sometimes see me as this black athlete who is like really fast because she's black and like she's gonna like you know, I, but it's just, I'm so much more than that. And like, I'm obviously, I'm very proud of my skin and also very proud of my athletic ability and like, like always very thankful of what I can do on the field. Um, but I am like, and like a whole human being with like all these really, really awesome things um, attached to me, which I, which I really love. And yeah, for like coaches moving forward, a takeaway for me is just like, um, yeah, just having those conversations and being open, um, being like ready for feedback and like being ready to like get feedback and then actually like execute what you've heard and what you've learned. I think like there's a lot of listening going on, which I really, really admire and I love, but I need to have action attached to that. And I think um, that's something that we're sometimes missing. Yeah. Thank you, Charity. And I think it's worth noting it's I get I think there would be some challenges there again without the with, with the with the misrepresentation or lack of representation, CJ. Uh, I think yeah, I've I've experienced that um, overseas, uh, being like one of the only imports and being on like a teammate on, on a team where I'm one of the one or two black 
you know, athletes on the team, I think that it's an expectation of you to perform a certain way, um, to perform in circumstances that are like really what you shouldn't be um, performing in. But, you know, um, as she said too, as um, Charity said, similar thing, like don't be afraid for coaches to take away. Like, don't be afraid to have the conversation. Um, at the same time, be mindful of who you're having the conversation with. And, you know, everyone, every person is a different angle to take toward them. Like, you know, you wouldn't attack, you wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't come at someone like, you know, it's different ways to have different conversations, conversation. like certain people to say, different people take things different ways. So just be mindful of that, you know, but I definitely think it's, um, it's time to have uncomfortable conversations, right? We're in an uncomfortable time. So that's the only way we're going to get through it. Thank you so much to our athlete panelists that are able to join us uh, this evening as BCCA brand ambassadors. And I wanted to leave the coaches with something. Um, I think we had 12 hands go up out of the 70 odd uh, coaches that we have in the room. And I want to challenge each coach in here to ask themselves and think critically why I don't have more BIPOC athletes that I'm coaching. And I think that might be a part two. I'm throwing that out there for Isabel and Francis. Um, uh, but I think it's an important conversation to have as well. How do we create pathways for BIPOC athletes, for BIPOC coaches in sports where there have, haven't been color? Nathalie? Yes, yeah, so unfortunately it's time to wrap things up. Um, we will, uh, I hope you guys <laughs> loved the session and was really interesting to you. Um, so there is a link in the chat for a quick feedback survey. Um, the link should also be posted on the slide presented right now, um, if you could fill that out. I also wanted to mention that the BCCA has an event uh, February 25th and 26th um, called Coaching Black Her Story Coach Hangout and Q&A. Registration link for that will also be posted in the chat shortly. We also have our next Coaching Through COVID webinar on March 24th. Um, and that link will be posted in the chat as well. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Stay safe. Thank you. Thank you, bye.